Hey there, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Turner and I direct the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm really excited to have, I mean, A, I love drinking tea and nothing's better than having tea with a friend and talking about China environment. Um, today's meeting, Walking the Walk, US-China Climate uh, Relationship um, is co-sponsored by the China Environment Forum, Science, Technology and Innovation Program and the Environmental Change and Security Program and our Kissinger Institute, so big group putting this on today. So, um, so as we all know, the, the US-China relationship has long been fraught with tensions and kind of, yeah, more than just fighting like siblings. Um, about a year ago, when the new administration came in, the, the US and China, the, the trade war tensions were high, other tensions have been growing in the relationship. But in 2021, we had not one, but two climate agreements of sorts. There was an April climate crisis statement and where both countries listed kinds of issues they thought were important, uh, brought to us by our two climate envoys. And again, our two climate envoys, John Kerry and Shea Jenhua, also were probably the muscle behind the 11th hour Glasgow US-China climate declaration, focusing on near-term action. Um, now, both of these documents have lists of priorities that could help both countries decarbonize, even decarbonizing their efforts in the global South, but they're not very, detailed on what it means for in terms of, is this partnership, is it good cooperation? Now today, to kind of help us kind of sort through whether or not the two countries are gonna walk the walk on climate cooperation, we're talking to Dr. Fan Dai, who heads the California China Climate Initiative out at UC Berkeley. She used to also work in the California government doing helping the subnational cooperation on climate and environment. So she's the numero uno expert uh, in terms of subnational cooperation. And um, Fan Huanying, welcome to our green tea chat. Um, wanna, wanna tap you for your smarts on you know, what, what are we thinking about this climate cooperation? And maybe first though, could you talk a little bit about the California China Climate um, Initiative? Hi everybody, and thanks Jennifer for uh, having me today. It's really my pleasure to be here and having tea with you and sharing some of my, uh, my thoughts and observation on this very important partnership, uh, if we can call it, between the US and China. Uh, first, let me just uh, quickly tell you a little bit about myself and Institute. Um, I am um, the director of the California China Climate Institute. This institute was established back in 2019 and it, it is chaired by former governor Jerry Brown and vice chaired by Mary Nichols, who was also the chair of California Air Resources Board, the muscle behind California's climate policy. Um, the mission of our institute is really to advance climate cooperation uh, among subnationals, especially between California and China, where we uh, had you know, organized uh, a variety of dialogues and training sessions. And we do a couple of policy research projects at the institute uh, with, the, with the goal to really kind of help scale in the deployment of climate uh, technologies, renewable energy, and climate solutions, both in California and China. Um, we actually recently, not quite recently, last year, we published a serious uh, report, which named as Getting to Net Zero, uh, which we outlined basically the pathway for the US and China of getting to net zero, which we call you know, uh, decarbonization to zero um, by the mid-century. And we identified some common milestones, both for the US and China to achieve along the way, and some um, opportunities for the two sides to coordinate and cooperate as possible. And this year, our work, uh, we have just launched a new study, which will be looking at uh, measuring subnational climate actions, both in the States and in China, with a mapping tool we uh, made public available uh, on our website and some data analysis of the emission levels and evaluation of what the, the policy impacts have been uh, in, the, in the two, you know, in China and in the US. So just a, a little bit of kind of overview of what we're doing here at the Institute. So, so do you think that, that so, I mean, just, just short version, first time, the, the 11th hour Glasgow declaration, did you see that as something that, are, is, is it, is it going to open up opportunities for you 
in your work to be kind of the subnational matchmaker? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I do think the Glasgow uh, Declaration was a really positive sign of the, um, you know, showing the intention um, of, the, of the two sides of working together. I see the impact of the uh, declaration in three folds. Uh, first is domestically. I think what they agreed upon, which was set forth in the joint declaration, also indicates um, the commitment level of domestic action and priorities being set domestically in the US and China for climate at home. And for example, I think there are a few topics that was spelled out uh, at the declaration, such as methane emission reduction, transportation decarbonization, power sector decarbonization, and resilience. I think these are priorities also being set domestically um, in the States and China. However, I think we probably wouldn't be able to see much synergies just yet of them working together on all of those. I do um, think these are more like uh, priorities that will be uh, implemented separately in parallel in the two countries. The second fold of the impact that I see of the agreement is uh, bilateral. I think bilaterally, what the two sides can work together could be really beneficial. And it could be win-win situation if designed carefully enough or wise enough. Um, simply, you know, as we see, one can learn from the other on some of those policies. Um, in the past, we used to claim a lot of credits of exporting uh, California's policy experiences to China. But I also think uh, what China has done quite successfully, for example, in decarbonizing their transportation sector, especially through the very rapid deployment of zero emission uh, vehicle cars, electric cars, could be learned by us as well. And China is also the biggest market for a lot of renewable um, development and climate solutions. So I think if a US company could be successful in China, it could be successful globally. So I think that also uh, is a really good potential for future collaboration among technologies and solutions. And of course, we need to be aware of some potential IP uh, risks and uh, force the technology transfer. I don't, I know we're not going into this blind side. And internationally, I think the two country, you know, being able to work out the language of the declaration and, uh, you know, either working separately domestically in their home country or working together um, bilaterally, this, this would have significant impact globally. Some example as, you know, stop financing coal as China already announced to stop financing coal projects and switching into renewables, I think these would have a very uh, significant impact in the world of uh, renewable development. Also, you know, the two countries working together will help keep the Paris Agreement uh, alive and the reporting very uh, inventory of climate pollutants, especially for this one, I think uh, the, the, the Glasgow Declaration is really focused on uh, short, you know, short term, which is mm -hmm. the 2020s. So when we, when we think about the short-lived climate pollutants and all these, I think the inventory and reporting of methane and other um, short-lived climate pollutants would be really um, you know, significant as well. And even competition between the US and China on some of those technologies would help bringing down the cost of renewables. I do think you know, uh, internationally, uh, bilaterally and domestically, the, the main, you know, it's, it's very meaningful to see this um, Glasgow Declaration come into uh, reality. And, and so, but so with, but, but we see that at the national level, there's still, I mean, both countries are having some domestic, you know, domestic problems, like uh, a Biden administration didn't pass, you know, the Build Back Better Act yet. And so, but do you think that like, you know, even if like at the national level, if they're not moving quickly, what do you think is gonna be like the next steps for what, what your organization or what the, the, the state of California will do in terms of, of, of concrete cooperation? Yeah, exactly. I think that um, the declaration did open up some space for subnationals or we call non-state actors to play a role and contribute to um, the, this global climate region. And what my organization institute is pretty um, 
uniquely positioned here is we really, you know, we take the subnational um, action as core of our research and some of the dialogues that we're setting up. I, I do think subnational will be an important um, contribution for, you know, whatever side the U.S. or China to achieve their their targets long term and near term. So it's really important to look at what seven nationals are actually capable of doing and how they could how they can set the right targets and figure out the pathway to get to mid-century and, and even um, beyond that. Well, what, in, what's a concrete example? Like I mean, you could draw, obviously there's nothing that's happened new since then, but what's something, you know, maybe even from a few years ago where you had, I know that the city of LA was working yeah. with different cities in China. What are some concrete results that, that you saw in the previous years from this subnational cooperation? Yeah, um, speaking about concrete results and, and action, I, I think we, you know, we do want to recognize what subnational can do and the limitation of subnational action here. Uh, I want to start with pointing out a fundamental difference in the U.S. and China when it comes to subnational action. Well, in the U.S., you know, the federal system, state authority and, and administrative capacity, there are certain ways that we could uh, we could tackle climate at the state's level, including, you know, through executive order that we can set a target and we have a suite in California uh, specifically, we have a suite of policy tackling different sectors, including the energy sector, transportation, building, and the natural and working land sector to uh, bring down emission and also, you know, uh, build up our resilience for climate. But in China, rather, the um, autonomy, if we could call it, or the authority at the state level and municipal level is a little bit different, well, not mm -hmm. actually fundamentally different than in the, in the U.S. But the good thing is the top-down approach being taken by the Chinese government um, traditionally to tackle climate um, actually was, it's a strong booster for um, state or provincial and municipal level action in China. So I think there is definitely a really high level of alignment of intention and the capacity at the subnational level, both in the US and China. And speak concretely about what, you know, in the past, the, you know, the results that we have seen. A couple examples here. Um, one is, I, I like to use Shenzhen, which is a city we worked quite closely. Um, both on the cap and trade program when the city was a pilot um, and on zero emission vehicles. Shenzhen actually has about, about, I think they took about three to five years to electrify their public transit and their all taxis are electric and they're doing that. They're taking the same approach for um, their commercial cars and, and, and their buses cars. are all electric too. Yeah, their buses are all, all electric. So that was a change that when we started working with them, it was definitely, you know, I think very rapidly adopted by, by the government. And mm. I think that demonstrated what a step national could do. Um, in this area of, you know, decarbonizing the transportation and definitely another province in China, which is Hainan province. It's like the Florida in, in the US. Um, <laughs> the Hawaii, had, please. <laughs> yeah, oh, Hawaii, yes. Um, they had also announced a, um, a ban on uh, combustion engine cars. So by 2035. So that's that's what, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing at the subnational levels, those policy changes. And the cabin trade too, when we started working with Chinese subnationals, including Shenzhen municipality, including the Guangdong province, mm -hmm. that was about 2013 and 2014. They were called, uh, I think they were called emission trading scheme pilots in China. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to provide hands-on experience of California program, you know, how we design a cap, how we allocate our allowances, how do we set up the benchmarking, all these in very uh, technical terms and, and details exchange with them. Mm -hmm. um, it was really, for me, I think it's really amazing to see that they have now built up a very robust program, not just at subnational level, even at the national level. Some of those methodology and some of those design were later adopted by the national yeah. cap and trade program in China. So I think these are really concrete 
in a way, uh, you know, concrete yeah. results that we have seen of those subnational exchange and cooperation um, in the past. I, I want to interject. There's one that I think it was more probably it was before your current institute was created. But um, my friend Barbara Finnemore at uh, back when she was at Natural Resources Defense Council, mm -hmm. that she also helped create the was the U.S. China Energy Efficiency Alliance. And basically they help broker a partnership between California and Jiangsu province on demand side management on energy efficiency. And, you know, at the time everyone's like, why are you doing that? Well, guess what? I mean, you know, you know, the end of the story is that this, these pilots that looking at how, you know, how could an entire province really, you know, kind of become really promote more energy efficiency more comprehensively. Well, th that pilot percolated up and became part of a demand side management law in China. So I think mm -hmm. that this is, it's kind of an example that, you know, a lot of times when we think about China, again, very top down, but yeah. we can't really ignore the fact that some, not every, but some provinces and cities can have a little bit more elbow room. I mean, Shenzhen is special because obviously, you know, the very first, you know, it's a provincial level city. Um, yeah. What do you think though, that now as in, in moving forward, what do you, what do you, you know, looking at, you have this, these two climate agreements, it's like a big menu, right? What yeah. do you think, what do, what do you think that that you guys or people in your network? I mean, for the past and under the previous administration, when when the relationship was very cold on energy and climate, um, at your institute, you had a lot of, I mean, they were mainly closed meetings, but you've been talking, I mean, like I do too, but you talk really intensively with some of the high-level Chinese researchers, national lab folks. What do you think is going to from those conversations, what do you think could be the next substantive, you know, subnational cooperation that you know maybe could maybe it's going to have to percolate up again, bottom up? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, my my observation of that is um, I, I do think there is still a need for subnationals um, there, and not to say when it was the Trump era that we the subnationals really played a quite quite some role to you know keep those communication. Our venue of life um, and the institute, we actually help put together some dialogues between governors in the US and governors in China when there was basically no talk at the federal national level about climate. So, you know, that really? was, Who, that what, was, was can, can you um, name names or is it secret? <laughs> no, I mean, those dialogues we, we put together was more, you know, off the record and mm -hmm. it was, you know, closed door. But I think the, the communication at that level represents the intention and represents the interest at the subnationals that they're still learning from each other. They don't mm -hmm. want to shut the door. They still want to keep the keep those, uh, you know, alive. Mm -hmm. And they still uh, were interested in such exchange and, of course, the potential such exchange could bring together um, for other opportunities. So I think but, that was uh, more politically, you know, it could be politically framed as uh, more strategic, you know, communication on climate or whatsoever. But I think nowadays with with the Biden administration and, you know, the the declarations we have now, I think the path rather is more clear. Um, and I think the focus today is more on implementation. How do, we, how do we really get to the point we want? It's not about, you know, back in 2015, it was more, you know, we need to agree upon, we need to, you know, get to this Paris Agreement, we need the political uh, influence there, we need the consensus there. But today I think it's more about how do we really um, deliver those targets we set, you mm -hmm. know, elsewhere um, as well. But I think for subnationals, they're really uniquely positioned here because they are not just the test beds, but they are at the frontier of implementing those policies. You can't just rely on the national government or the federal government here to tell us what to do and to you know, deliver at the finish line the emission reduction. You need to bring in subnational governments and you need their implementation. And actually, you also need the private sectors to be part of that. And especially in China, you know, those companies, not just private companies, the companies, the business, yeah. the business world, a lot of SOEs, state-owned companies and, and private companies, they need to be part of that. So I think the non-state actor or, you know, we, we often refer to track two of yeah. those dialogues, right? The track two uh, is, is a really a big driving force for a lot of actions that are going to happen. 
what, what do you think from, again, like that big menu of, of different types of priorities, what are some specific areas? I mean, you know, cause there's, there's a lot on methane. You mentioned that, for example, you said that you've created this kind of a, a tracker that's gonna be looking at benchmarks. What are some of the specific things that you guys are gonna be monitoring over the, the next year or so? Actually, I have to add for the audience, for some reason, my widget to take questions is not working. So I'm sorry if you're, if you're submitting questions, you can email me at jennifer.turner at wilsoncenter.org jennifer.turner at wilsoncenter.org. My widget's not working today. Sorry. So Fan, can you answer that question about, you know? Yeah, what? yeah, sure. I, I think uh, we don't need to repeat ourselves about those areas that, you know, worked well. Um, but I think some, I do see some new opportunities after this That's declaration what, yeah. at the subnational level. I think mathing, Jennifer, you mentioned is a really, I, I see that as a really big one, not just because the impact of, of methane and short-lived climate pollutants, but also the gap, if you take a look at what the, you know, the, the, the actions being taken in, in the States and the action being taken in China, I think there is a huge gap for um, not just subnationals, for, for all of us to fill. And uh, one so, so we're, we're both area, doing poorly. <laughs> not good enough. Okay, I think a specific a area is the inventory to build a more, um, you know, we, we have been working at the uh, CLE, which is the Center of Law and Energy and Environment at Berkeley. Um, we have some colleagues working on protocols of, um, you know, methane inventory for mm -hmm. the oil and gas sector. And we haven't done yet on, you know, coal, which will be a significant part in China and, you know, waste and agricultural. So these are the sectors that I think both sides share a lot of things in common. And we definitely can align some of our, you know, protocols and standard for the inventory part. And also mm -hmm. based on what we know about the, in the inventory, the emissions, then we can come up with some solutions, um, you know, on both sides to, to tackle it. So I think mathing is definitely going to be a really important topic in the near term. Um, and another topic that I wanted to bring up, which wasn't quite uh, much of a focus in the past was climate legislation. And maybe being here at the law school, we kind of dealt a lot with the uh, climate legislation, but I do think that's another area that will, uh, it's worth some more attention um, mm -hmm. because China does not yet have climate change law. And it's- That's true. The, the I, I didn't think of that yet. But they have mm -hmm. a lot of clean energy laws and a lot of prioritization. What, what, would a clean, what would a climate law look like or what should it look like? In, in my mind, and this is totally, you know, talking out of the blue, I think the, the, the core part of that is to make, make it clear of climate pollutants. What are those climate pollutants and how you're going to regulate them? And what are the agency's authorities and, you know, the yeah. enforcement mechanism and, and all that that's missing in the current um, legal system in China, which I personally think is really important. And I think it's a, it's a big part of um, California successful story of how yes. you know, we were able to, to get to where we are. So I think that's so, another area of new um, you know, opportunity for, for more research and collaboration. I think that what's good to note is that that too that why you know because I, I was wondering at first like why methane but remember that um, Shea Jianhua made a comment I think it was at Glasgow that China's zero carbon that their carbon neutrality also includes neutrality and all these other kinds of yeah. um, of greenhouse gases and I was really pleasantly surprised with that um, but what about um, what about um, agriculture? Is that is is because you mentioned that there's the methane and oh, someone just emailed me a question. But let me jump on this question since I got one in from yep. Kristen McDonald from uh, Pacific Environment. Question for you, Fan. A key area of potential cooperation between California and China is decarbonization of shipping, as there is a huge corridor between the yes. China and the U.S. What are some opportunities on the horizon to push for clean shipping corridor pilots and? that could put China and California in the lead on this front. Because I do have to inter interject that yes. LA and Shanghai work together for, they've been working together for like 15 years on a, on, on a green port initiative. So working mm -hmm. on greening the actual ports, lowering the CO2 emissions. What do you have to say to Kristen about that? Thank you for the question, Kristen. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, Kristen. And I, I do want to admit that green shipping has been an area um, between California and China in terms of cooperation and a lot of exchange. 
we actually went to Shanghai a few years ago. That was before the pandemic to look at their the Shanghai port of you know to look for opportunities to work with them. I think for green shipping and for goods movement,、um, I think one of the really big opportunity here and and you know working with China is to、um, set some consistent、um, you know standard or requirement for the ships. Coming out of Shanghai or coming into Shanghai, coming out of LA and coming into LA, so that you know we're we're making a really consistent requirement to、mm-hmm. those ships in terms of you know when they should shift it to、um, you know electric when they're just waiting to get you know boarded and, and they're waiting a long time. <laughs> yeah, now they're waiting a long time. And also for some of the infrastructure, I think we could also you know align the standards as well. Um, and I think just for for the good ship、uh, goods movement part, there's a, a lot of potential. And actually, the, the impact of you know working on something is really really big because goods movement and and you know green shipping the shipping part actually takes a takes a big part of the greenhouse gas emission at、yeah. those areas. So good. So an area for leadership. I also、yes. got Naomi、um, from Forest Trends said that in the in the Glasgow Agreement in Article Ten. Says recognize that eliminating global illegal deforestation would contribute meaningfully to the effort to reach the Paris goals, and she's unclear because in it it says there's which laws banning illegal imports are being referenced in that agreement, because、um, China does not have the equivalent of a Lacey Act, right? Because we you know we won't import products that come from、mm-hmm. illegal you know illegal timber. Do you have any? She says, does Fan have any intel? And she also yeah. So she's、yeah. kind of curious, but she also, but notice that it also referred to illegal deforestation. When in、okay. fact we do know there's also legal deforestation that also is pretty、um, serious. Any insights on that, or do we need to punt that one? Yes, I think the、uh, just to share my my、uh, understanding of why that was in there. I think that the illegal banning illegal deforestation was already a part of Chinese domestic policy, so it wasn't something new created in in the Glasgow Declaration. But Jennifer, you're right. What's missing there is. Internationally, if you would look at the supply chain, China does not have Lazy Act、um, there. So I think that's where maybe it's just a baby step that they're willing to explore how you know banning illegal deforestation in China and how that's being handled、um, you know outside of China, so that they could be better coordinated in some of those. And I do think that will have impact on the supply chain of、right. um, you know woods and wood products. Well, related to that, that that、uh, we、um, think about the the deforestation that happens when I mean China, the U.S., and Europe import soybeans,、yes. leather,、um, uh, beef from from Latin America. That the the U.S. and the EU are working on the idea of of kind of trying to regulate you know commodities this way.、Mm-hmm. And I think that there's an opportunity because remember I started off our whole conversation with like the tension between the U.S. and China. There's an opportunity maybe to kind of Maybe have a little troika of、yes. of U.S. Europe. I mean, you know, I mean, they're the big dogs. But those、mm-hmm. three coming together on these kind of setting, kind of a global standard for that、yeah. for regulating、um, that. I can also、um, the Wilson Center. We just actually just、um, we published something about how, comparing EU and China in terms of the 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 deforestation footprint that they have. Well, we'll post that on our on our website. We got one more quick question that I, we're kind of running out of time. I'm sorry, I should have told people to email sooner.、Um, Oh, she said emissions data has often been regarded sensitive in China. Will that be a challenge for the methane data collection in subnational cooperation or in the kind of tracking that you're doing?、Um, yeah, what, what do you say about that? Yes, can you get I, the data? I imagine. Yes, I imagine that will continue to be a challenge, but I do see an opening here, which is through some pilots that you know,、uh, for example, provinces or cities in China who are willing. To you know, serve as a pilot and work with us, work with the outside、um, to improve their data transparency. You know, starting from the mapping part is fine, but we we want to you know really tackle that. I don't think you know things are going to change overnight、um, on data transparency, but I do think there are some openings if we think through you know some strategies working with pilots in China, and that could be an opening for some more cooperation. And、um, you know, things might be differently then. Yeah. Well. 
I'm very honest when I, I make people come on time for starting. And I also feel like I should end on time. But and the key too, like just like in show business, leave them wanting more. Um, sorry again about my question widget going off the rails today. But just so you guys know, beforehand, Fawn and I were talking and we want to do some meeting. We're going to co-sponsor some meetings together. So we're going to bring the fabulously cool West Coast with the somewhat nerdy East Coast folks together. So we're going to be doing more meetings that will do some deeper dives into some of the issues that Fawn brought up today. Can't thank you enough. And you know, Jayo, you know, as you as you leap into the tiger year, you know, I want to be working with you. And I want to thank the audience for being patient with my technical difficulties today. But we got in three great questions. And you can always email me and I can I can connect you with Fawn, or you could probably find her online and email her directly. But again, thank you so much, Fawn. And I want to thank my AV team for getting us on here online. And um, remember, drink more tea, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.